our first presentation is going to be from Mr. Ajad Swan from India, and he works with Development Seed. And let's clap for him as he starts. Good morning, everybody. I feel like the coffee was a little late. I got my fix, but I'm not sure. So I'll try to keep it short um, and give you all a lot of room to ask uh, questions or even talk to each other. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here to talk about uh, one of my favorite projects over the years um, at Development Seed. My name is Sajjad. I come from the OpenStreetMap community in India. Um, been a long time OpenStreetMap contributor. Um, and uh, I currently work at Development Seed where um, over the years we've been working on OpenStreetMap software as well as contributing data and helping other people use OpenStreetMap tools um, in, in their projects. Um, so if you want to know more about what we do, uh, please come find um, me or Lane or Vitor, um, some of us are around here. Um, so today I wanted to talk about um, and also largely kind of pose a couple of questions that we've been thinking about at Development Seed about how we maintain and manage and grow the software around OpenStreetMap. Um, so there'll be very little talk about tagging and data and geometries and things like that. Um, so it kind of comes from uh, the context is that OpenStreetMap software is used by many projects and organizations outside of OpenStreetMap and more so in the recent years with uh, a lot more adoption um, of some data and, you know, people wanting to do more validation, quality control and things like that. And, um, and this is great because it gives, um, we get a lot more people to look at the software, we get a lot more people to test, we have people contributing um, a lot of new things um, and generally kind of improves the software ecosystem around OpenStreetMap. And you would have listened to some of the conversations uh, yesterday and also online. Um, so some examples of projects that use kind of the entire OpenStreetMap stack is, for instance, Open Historical Map, um, been around for a few years. Um, I'll talk about Open Historical Map kind of in depth in a little bit. Um, then there's stuff like open geofiction where you know people are just doing it for fun, just drawing maps of made up places. Uh, this intersection is very disturbing. I thought I should not have all the fun by myself by looking and being very anxious about it, uh, but we'll skip that. But it's, yeah, it is, it's a lot. <laughs> um, then I, also people using parts of the OSM software. So for instance, um, if you look at, how do I go back? Yeah. So if you look at open historical map and open geofiction and stuff, they, they pretty much use like the entire stack of the API, the database, the API, the Rails application, which is, you know, this front end basically, and then the editors to kind of build, build the whole thing, right? Like you have the entire stack, except that it's not called open street map. Um, but there are also projects like OpenCMap, which uses the data that's within OpenStreetMap to, you know, create custom rendering stack and build different maps, and nautical maps, for instance. Um, so there are kind of different pieces of the software ecosystem that's used by different organizations and projects, and some of them have been, you know, vastly successful. And projects like Rapid and one of the forks of ID, which has been extremely well maintained, um, have improved the general workflow of mapping for OSM as well as for people outside. And I think this is really important because it it kind of improves very critical workflows and introduces um, very interesting and new changes in how people map in OpenStreetMap and use and consume OpenStreetMap data. Um, so yeah, so there are a lot of examples. Um, you can find them uh, everywhere. So, for instance, ed in education, so Teach OSM um, is a group that uses OSM software outside of OSM to kind of teach people how to map, teach people concepts of geospatial data management, things like that. Um, with the rise of machine learning and also doing a lot of like geospatial training data set generation, um, groups like HOT uh, use OpenStreetMap software uh, to, you know, just set up and draw things with the same tools like JOSM and ID and be able to export that into uh, their training pipelines and um, 
a lot of groups use uh, OSM software for just kind of validation. Um, as a groups like Gojack, Hot, we do it at Development Seed as well. Um, we don't want to uh, make mistakes in, in OSM. We want to do it in like a, in a sandbox, try the things that we want to try, test out, and then, you know, throw it away. Um, National Park Services used to use OSM. I'm not sure if they still do, but they, I think they were like one of the first ID forks that was really popular. Um, and then, uh, you know, a lot of research and academic work that people are doing around open historic map and projects like that. Um, so this is great. Um, I think we've built something more than the data that we've all been contributing over many years. Um, it, it has presented this massively successful way of collaboratively editing map data and processing that. And I think that's a lot. Um, and it, it means a lot when other people are using our software because you know, there's probably nothing better or easier ways to do it. Um, or it's just a hard problem that, you know, no one's really worked on it. Um, what's important to note is that all of this is very distributed. And I think that contributes to a huge part of the success of OSM. Um, like all the, all the things that we use on a daily basis uh, as part of the OpenStreetMap software is built, designed, or maintained by um, different people, different organizations. It's not a single entity that's managing everything. So, I, yeah, I tried to fit as many as I could, but there's like, you know, there's like, there's like a whole wiki page of like things that are people maintaining for OSAM. So there's the website, Nominatum, Overpass, Tag Info, ID, and all the editors, processing tools like Osmium, OSAM to PGSQL, Task Manager. Um, so it's a, it's, it's very distributed. There's like, there's very little overlap in terms of who's building all of these things. And they're all kind of different individuals and different organizations, which is great because it brings, it is, I guess, like the biggest reason for the success also that like, if, if you come across a problem within OSM, it's more likely that someone else has that as a bigger problem and they would probably fix it. So, which is nice. So you kind of search for it and find or talk to other people. Um, so we've been kind of helping people use OSM software uh, for many years. And um, I started talking about this first in 2015 at Stays Map in New York. Um, and we kind of floated this idea of like, oh, what if we could just like have someone install OSAM stack um, and just like run, you know, you, you can import your own data set if you want, you can import like a small extract of OSAM if you want and do whatever analysis you want, do editing, teach people, do some research, whatever. Um, turns out it wasn't that easy. Um, and it took us quite a few years to figure out a nice way to do it. And uh, that's OSAM seed. So I think we started working on OSAM seed around 2016. 2017. Um, it started because um, at Development Seed, we were doing a lot of machine learning work uh, back then, and we still do. Um, and we were doing a lot of training data generation. Our data teams were very plugged into the OSM workflow. They really enjoy using JAWSM. They like ID. They like the workflows around pulling out the data and processing. Um, so we just needed a way to kind of spin up stack OSM stacks and turn them off when we don't need it. Um, so that's kind of where we built OSM Seed. Um, and it's, it's merely just a collection of doc files that allows you to run like a single instance of um, containerized OpenStreetMap software. So it is, there isn't a lot of magic. Um, it's pretty simple, but it's hard to do because all the software is managed and maintained by multiple people. Uh, there are different motivations around how it should be, how it's meant to be used, how it's set up, how they talk to each other. And, and that's kind of the biggest problem, right? Like there are a lot of, like there is replication, but then there are all the other applications that use replication in kind of different ways. Um, and you wanna try and fit all that into one uh, sort of single thing that you can run and, uh, and maintain. Um, so we've been building OSMC for a while. Um, we, uh, been kind of closely working with Open Historical Map for a few years. Um, and it, this is a very old project. I mean, there are folks like Tim uh, here in the audience who've been you know, part of the project and helped and contribute. So, um, yeah, so OHM 
wanted to grow and try to do this by just kind of setting up individual pieces of software themselves. And it was very hard to maintain, to keep up uh, when Overpass has a new version, when the Rails website has a new version, to keep up and it was very hard. So we kind of stepped in to help. Um, so some of the things you'll know, so OHAM kind of uses the entire stack. So um, by default, OSMC gives you vector tiles, which was kind of a design decision we made. We didn't want to do raster. Uh, which worked out really well because in this case you can see there's like a little time slider and it's just showing the changes on the map over time, which you know would be hard to do with Rastiv unless you make a lot of uh, network requests and this you know you just load the tiles once and you have a slider. Um, there's now an atom um, with the whole auth and uh, the Rails API integrated. There's JAWS and people use ID. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just a really nice way to kind of manage uh, some more examples of what pe people are doing crazy stuff with open historic where I'm like blown away. So this is just London. There are s several cities that people are actively mapping right now. Um, yeah, it's quite nuts um, and quite really quite fantastic to see how these things. So each of these objects have a start date and end date and that's that's really it. Um, and then some of the, uh, some of our designers, uh, at our partner organization called Green Info, have been also kind of playing around with different kinds of styles. Um, so with the vector tiles that that come with OSM Seed, they've been you know building um, additional styles on top of the historical data people have been mapping. Um, so we started thinking about okay, what does this mean to kind of run OSM Seed at scale? And um, I pulled out these stats, and these are very small compared to where OSM is. And I don't think I think it's going to be all. It's going to be a while before OHM reaches that point. But um, I feel like the way we've architected OSM seed and the way you can kind of plug in and manage e individual software resources and things like that, it, it grows and it has grown over the last couple of years. Um, but it's still, it's still very small. And I want to kind of put that in perspective. This is, I'm not coming here to say that, you know, I think this is the moment where OSM needs to just, you know, stop hosting on bare metal. Um, infrastructure and go to the cloud. I don't think, I, I think we're like very way, well way off from um, those kind of scenarios, but I think it's a pretty good moment to start thinking about what it means to kind of run our software generally um, uh, outside of existing infrastructure. Um, so we use Kubernetes and I, I know there's like, it's a pretty divisive thing when it comes to how people perceive uh, orchestrating um, containerized applications. Um, we found it useful because, I guess only because there were multiple uh, disconnected pieces of software and we wanted to give people the ability to kind of turn on and off the things that they don't want to use. So not everybody wants to use Overpass, not everyone wants to use Norman Adam. Um, a lot of people just don't care about things like Tag Info or Task Manager. And this just gave us a nice way to just, you know, enable and disable things that we don't want. And uh, it, it was nice. And um, it also meant that we're not tied to a particular cloud provider. You could deploy across multiple cloud providers. You could even stand up your own Kubernetes server and run it. Um, so it kind of gave us that flexibility without having to do a lot of orchestration code ourselves. Um, so yeah, so there, uh, so if you go to GitHub um, for OSMC, you'll see a bunch of these directories. These are all just directories with Docker files. And uh, so you'll see like the web container, you have the tile server, we use Imposum for kind of managing the, updating the tiles and the expiry, task manager, planet processing, replication, all of that stuff. Um, and it works pretty well. Um, and uh, we kind of, so from, from the start, we always thought about OSMC as kind of a package that people can take and install and be very flexible about what they want to get. And um, for that kind of, we use something called Helm, which is part of the Kubernetes ecosystem, um, allows us to just publish the packages. Uh, as, so let's say we update the version of Norman Atom, we'll publish a version um, that has the new version of Norman Atom, which people can update to. Um, it also allows people to fork the package and then say, um, use a fork of OSM website, use a fork of Norman Atom, for instance. So for instance, OHM, Open Historical Map, does not use the same OpenStreetMap website code. 
they've forked it, they've made a bunch of changes to customers, you know, change the logo, text, and things like that. Um, so it, it kind of gives you a really nice way to manage that. Um, and a lot of people have found that very useful. Um, we find it very useful too. Um, some things that are that are on the roadmap, uh, we want to be able to easily. So this is something that we've talked to some folks that teach OSM and a couple of other people who kind of teach OSM in universities to be able to kind of go to a website, spin up a stack, get a URL. You can plug that into JAWSM and things like that. Go from there, and yeah, just make things a lot more reliable. Um, so it's a really great way to bring OSM software together. Um, I don't think it's like the only way to do it. I feel like people do this a lot of time, a lot of different ways. Um, uh, but it, yeah, it's one of the ways that you can kind of easily get some updates, manage manage your infrastructure. Um, so I'll leave with kind of two big questions, which I don't have any answers to. I feel like it would be nice to chat more about these things. Um, it's very hard to use OSM software outside of OpenStreetMap, and I think that's it's fair. I don't think anybody's complaining. I think that's by design. Uh, but should we consider kind of making customization as part of the workflow of building OSM software? Should it be easier to change the logo and text and not have to have like a commit history of, you know, hundreds and uh, thousands of commits to just manage that? Um, and then I guess the larger question, I think, you know, folks like Jochen and uh, others have been thinking a lot about is the changes that we want to make in, in the general OSM software ecosystem. Should there be better coordination? Should there be, um, yeah, should there be kind of more conversations about how we grow the projects and the ecosystem in general? Um, and I think it's a hard one. I, I feel like, I feel like it's a hard one. It's not going to be solved by hiring like a CTO and, you know, putting them in that position and be like, okay, now nah, you go figure it out. Um, cause that's this, you know, it's like, so distributed, so many people, different kinds of problems. Um, but yeah, I think some of these, uh, things that feel like would be nice to figure out over the coming years as the project is growing and there are more and more people using our software. Um, yeah, and I, I hope you all check it out. Um, there are many people in the room also using first and seed. So I'm happy to talk more about that. And if, if you're interested, um, yeah, let us know. Uh, and my presentation is at that URL, and I'll tweet out as well. Thank you. Yeah, happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Sajay. So there's a question here. Um, will development seed continue to fund OSM well into the future? Will development seed continue to fund OSM seed well into the future? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, good question. So the question is, will, will we continue to maintain and fund OSM seed? Yeah, to a great extent, because we use it internally a lot. Um, we, you know, also have partners paying us to build and maintain it, which is great. Um, so, you know, it's not like a side project that I started. Um, so, yeah, and we're also looking for people to help us. So that would be great. Um, any questions from the audience? Hi, uh, thanks for the nice presentation. I wanted to ask, uh, is it possible to use uh, this stack that you are proposing to replicate just a part of the planet? So, because the, the, the main problem uh, when trying to, to work with the, the stack and the data of OpenStreetMap is that if you need to download the planet, it's a huge file and you need a big server and so on. So can you do this just for uh, one country or, yeah. or a region? Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. That was one of the biggest use cases why we built it, because we have partners who work in very small areas. They don't want to spend so much money, you know, replicating the entire planet. Um, so it's easier to have a small PBF that you can import and then use that if you want. Yeah. I have a question. Do you have uh, Docker Compose as well? If you don't, you don't like to bother with Kubernetes yeah. and just something simple. Yeah, so there is a Docker Compose workflow we use for testing locally. Uh, people have used it to kind of deploy. Um, I would say it wouldn't be very straightforward, but it does work for our development. So you could stand up on your own on a single machine if you want, yeah. Yeah. Um, what sort of contributions are you looking for from the community? Yeah. Um, 
I guess, I guess we're looking for, uh, I mean, I think one thing I would really like is if there are people who are interested in, say, like maintaining specific Docker files. So if someone says like, hey, I can make sure like the tag info Docker file is always up to date when there's a new version, or um, that would be nice if people want to adopt uh, certain parts of it. Um, yeah, and I think also just finding things that are broken would be nice. Um, and just generally help, yeah. I, anything, anything we can get, actually, yeah. I'm, I'm scared I might ask a statement instead of a question. Yeah, so, go for it. so, have you tried to upstream any of the, the Docker work into the, the projects upstream? Yeah, we have. And most of these Docker files are based on uh, what the original uh, projects publish. We've only made um, kind of smaller, well, we've made some changes to make sure like they kind of, they can talk to each other relatively well. Uh, some to make sure, uh, sometimes we want to use like S3 or some kind of storage to like, for instance, replication, right? Like we wanted to use S3. Um, so those kind of changes for, uh, for the most part, yeah, a lot of the Docker files, we make sure we update the same way. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a lot of work. Thank you. Oh. Um, thank you very much. Uh, one question. Um, you talked of the distributed nature of the OSM software community um, and the problems that it, you know, it comes with. Um, as a long-time OSM software developer, what opportunities for collaboration do you see in your community? Um, so, well, let me see. Hard question. Um, I, so I think the success of OSM software is because of the distributed nature. I feel like it would be very hard for us to be where we are if it was like, a, you know, it was run like a business. Um, I feel like it would have been different. Maybe it would have been successful, but I think it would be very different. I don't think we would have had a, uh, the sort of an organic approach to software development and growth. Um, but I don't think that means we shouldn't have better coordination. And I think there's a way better, there's a way to do that without having to have like one person at the top and like have a whole hierarchy. So I think that's the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you.